You know, it's funny. I actually was watching some Spider-Man cartoon, and I got to say, I got to say, you know what? The Hobgoblin is an underrated villain. <laughs> he is, honestly, because, like, he actually, in both episodes I've seen him in, because I'm re-watching the entire series. In both episodes I've seen him in, he actually outsmarts Spider-Man and, and his own adversaries every single time. You know what? You speak such truth. I'm starting the podcast like that. So we started Ooh. off hearing you talk about how great Hobgoblin is because you're right. He is. He's the best. Uh, but he's not as he good is. as Infinity Rewatch. Welcome, everybody. I'm Andrew Fantasia. <laughs> Who are you? I love it. Well. Uh, well, okay, yeah, sorry. I am uh, <laughs> I am Ryan J. Whitehead, who is uh, totally bewildered by the wonderful Hobgoblin. That's for sure. You are getting, it's official, it's just announced you're getting a Hobgoblin tattoo on your chest. Uh, <laughs> it's a motion tattoo, so when you move, he throws a, a, a razor bat like that. It just goes like that. So I can't wait yeah. to see it. We'll have a, a link in Twitter where you can see a photo of it uh, for $5. You got to pay up because... Somebody's got to help pay for that tattoo. Color tattoos yep. cost money, kids. Yeah, <laughs> 100%. 100%. So it's the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, the, the holiday season. And what better way to ring in the holiday season than a new Marvel show? Hey, that sounds hey. good to me. Hey. Woo. Ryan, what show just came out? Oh man. Okay, so this is the second Marvel project to do a Hall or sorry, Halloween to do a Christmas uh, story. And uh, we're talking about Hawkeye today. Hawkeye episodes one and two uh, just released on the Disney Plus platform. And, you know, I got to say the, the the releasing two episodes is pretty smart. Um, you know, I, I think they do. I think by releasing two episodes, I think it's actually a pretty smart way to do it. Because it gives you a, an, an atmosphere of what the show, what you can expect from the show. Mm hmm. And there, there is a lot here, and and I, I don't, I think I'm gonna kick it off here right out of the gate, sir, and kind of just one of the things I love about the show, and it it does it in the very beginning of this. So spoilers ahead for those of you who haven't watched it yet. If you haven't watched it yet, because you want to hear us our thoughts about it first, first of all, props to you. You are amazing, and uh, and and I hope you are subscribing. And if you're not, make sure you hit that subscribe button. For the Rebel Scum Podcast Network and joining us in our Infinity Rewatch. Um, now that we're out of the Infinity Saga and into this new saga, which doesn't really have a name yet. Um, we shouldn't even be allowed I to say Rewatch anymore. We're almost I know, we're breaking yeah. rules. We're a couple of little devils. I think it should be to infinity and beyond, you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um I I gotta say what I think I like about this this particular series a lot right out of the gate is I like how I like how it kind of already establishes the legacy that the Avengers have left behind because in the beginning of this episode we kind of get the the young life of Kate Bishop which is great a lot of really good exposition material there. But I think where it really kind of captures me right out of the gate is the the Battle of New York because um, we kind of first of all you know it's kind of like er it's the everyday life and then the Battle of New York happens. But what's cool about it is Kate Bishop really takes to Hawkeye and we get to see that moment of Hawkeye taking out the the Chitari and like then doing the swing into the building. I love that. I think it's epic. Um, and, and to me, I think that's what I want to see. That's, that to me is exactly where I want to be in a Marvel cinematic universe experience is I want to see what the consequences are. Um, I, I've, I've, we've seen a lot of kind of origin stories with, uh, Black Widow introducing the new Black Widow, uh, Song Chi and what if, and all these things. But I don't think they do kind of the more grounded stories. And I know grounded is not really a word you want to use in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But I really think that this show does a great job of doing a really grounded approach on like what has happened after the events of the Battle of New York. I don't know what you're talking about. I can't wait to see a dark, grounded Fantastic Four. Wait. <laughs> 
we that's what we need you know if i'm gonna do a fantastic four story i'm not gonna do what the comic books did oh no i'm gonna do a dark tragic realistic approach and very grounded on the fantastic four Mm -hmm. it's gonna be so realistic the thing doesn't even turn into a rock monster he's just always going to be holding a rock (laughs) it's symbolism oh yes wow yeah it's the coen brothers version of the fantastic four (laughs) uh I, uh, so I, I, this opening was, uh, it really surprised me in a lot of levels. I was not expecting to see the battle of New York. Um, another thing I wasn't expecting was, you know, I don't know anything about Kate Bishop going into this. I knew nothing about her other than she's, you know, she, the, the bow gets passed on to her. She is the next Hawkeye passing of the torch, if you will, passing of the torch, except in this case, it's not a stick on fire. It's a carefully bent metal thing with a string that can let you kill people. Mm -hmm. Uh, may not even be metal it might not yeah i don't know what it's made of we i haven't touched that thing hawkeye won't let me he won't let me near it um uh, <laughs> last year around this time last year i watched home alone the first home alone for the first time since i was a kid and one thing that caught me off guard was i'm sitting there watching it i'm like holy shit i never realized the McAllisters are filthy rich like they are gross rich. This house is. Have massive. you followed? Have you followed the conspiracy on like how much money his father would have need to have made in in the Home Alone series? Well, the actor who plays his father, John Hurd, he was in Sopranos. So I remember hearing like jokes of how that's all mob money. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's paying for that with the blood of some some unfortunate folks who are lying at the bottom of the yeah. river somewhere. <laughs> But I uh, I bring that up because Home Alone is a Christmas movie and Hawkeye is a Christmas story. So it reminded me of that because as soon as this started, the first thing that popped in my head was, oh, okay, I didn't know Kate Bishop was loaded because the first time we see her, you know, she's just in her little house and then you pan out and I'm like, oh, it is not a little house. Her stairway is bigger than my whole apartment. Um, I just, I was caught off guard by that and i was like okay show you got to try pretty hard to make me care about this really rich person who can afford a beautiful place in the middle of manhattan and luckily they did do that they did make me care about this person and uh pretty quickly too by showing the the catastrophic results of what happens when the chitari don't have their way and they get really angry at us and uh, it, it was it was a beautiful way to kick off this show and get us invested in her and they did what i love they did opening credits and through the opening credits they told us that story through those little animations of her growing up and being good at archery and getting bigger and getting stronger and mm-hmm. doing gymnastic flips and i was you know looking at her doing her flipping things and i'm i clearly know my gymnastic terms flipping thing is real it's a real phrase and i'm like oh she's, <laughs> she's kind of like daredevil uh, she can do a lot of the stuff Daredevil can do. And I was like, okay, I dig this. I dig that she she kind of batman herself. She was like, I lost a parent. I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to protect my mom. I'm going to protect my household. I'm going to do this. And now we have Kate Bishop. And right after the opening credits, I was already on board. And yes, I have a crush on Haley Steinfeld, but that doesn't matter. I was I would have still been on board even if I didn't. They did a wonderful job with that. I think, I, and again, I this what I hear about the show is pretty interesting. So I've been following kind of the behind the he, behind the scenes stuff of this. Um, this was done by, um, produced and directed by uh, uh, Reese Thomas, I think his name is, and Bert and Bernie, uh, the directing duo. Uh, but what I also didn't know about this is Kevin Feige actually had a personal touch to this one. He was very involved in the production of this one, which is good to hear. Um, and, and I think you can, I think what's really amazing is, is that you see it, you see, I think you see Kevin Feige's touch in this one because of the, the massive amount of comic book, comic book references in this one. There's a lot, there's a lot there. I think they actually Um, had Matt Fraction as a consulting producer. I think I saw his name in those. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to this, which is, and that's huge to actually have the comic book writer be a consulting producer on this which is pretty big um so this yeah so for this one first of all Haley was like feige's top choice like if they they were gonna do this they wanted Haley first or someone 
the equivalent of Haley, but they were like, you know what, let's reach out to her, see if she wants to do it. And lo and behold, she does. And and I think at this point, if you if you are an actor, you you want to be on the Feige train. You mm-hmm. you want to you want to be involved in some way, shape, or form on what Kevin Feige is doing. And and no doubt. And I think this is a good story. This is one of the best comic Marvel comics uh, that was done in a long time uh, by by Matt Fraction. This is a big story. This was this was this one put Hawkeye on the map as a more grounded a grounded character in a more relatable way. They went for kind of the heavy uh, storytelling emotions. So this is a big one to do. And so, yeah, this is a, this is a solid story with great talent and um, they really kind of just, they really do a good job on making this very urban street level uh, kind of heroics, which is something I was looking forward to. I, as much as I love the cosmic level and you know the the kind of supernatural level of Marvel comics, for me, I love a good street level hero style story. Give me heroes for hire. Give me Kate Bishop. Give me Defenders. You know, give me all those kind of characters because that's that's for me. I want to see, you know, I want to see the streets of New York go under these events because, you know, I want to see these street level heroes come out. You know what I mean? I want to see them come out to play because when you get a street level story, more often than not, you get a lot of crossover. And that's kind Mm -hmm. of what I'm hoping for with the story. Crossover is always good. And I do like my street level heroes as well. I'm looking forward to... um, a, a story because I think MCU is so good at this is they take street level, but it's still as vibrant and colorful as, and entertaining as when they do something like guardians of the galaxy. Um, yes. And absolutely. I think the, the proof is in the pudding because in this episode we get street level underground organized crime, but I can't tell you how happy I was Ryan with the fact that this is going to sound so weird, but just I was so pleased by the fact that the criminals we saw in this clandestine winery black market auction that Kate uh, ingeniously wormed her way into, the criminals we saw were the of the tuxedo wearing evil billionaire Bond villain variety. And I can't tell you how happy that makes me because I am six seasons deep into Arrow where every single villain is, I am Russian mobster. I am Russian bratva mobster. Every one of them. It's six seasons of that. And I'm like, you know, street level is more than just the Russian mafia, right? Like, expand, add some color and flair. Uh, I love Arrow still, but I mean, it just six seasons is pushing the limits of how much Bratva I can take. So even though we did end up getting some Russian mobsters in uh, in Hawkeye, I was so happy to see that auction because it reinforced, yes, there are different flavors of street rev- level villains. It's not just here comes a guy in a track suit with Das Vidania tattooed on his chest. They're giving us all the different flavors and colors because that's what Marvel is. So right. yeah. street level while still being a bag of Skittles, beautiful. The, as soon as she went into that winery auction, I was like, I'm on board for this. I am 100% on board because I was worried about the street level factor. Even though I like those kinds of heroes, I like the Daredevils and Jessica Joneses of the world. I was worried that it would lose the the vibrant Marvel touch and it didn't. So good on them for keeping that. It definitely didn't. But what I like about this one is the simplicity of it. I think this one is simple, but it's not a bad thing. I think it actually works really well because especially with the story is we get not only do we instantly understand Kate's angle and everything that takes place. And of course it's adapted. Like this is not your... This is not your direct translation from the comics. This is an d- adapted story. Classic Marvel formula is the events are the same, but the transitions and how we get to those events are different. And mm-hmm. again, this is only the first two episodes. And to be fair, a lot of the previews we've seen haven't really alluded to 
uh, it seems like episode three will be a lot of the kind of visual cues we've been getting from your trailers and what have you. But going back to it, the simplicity of the story is perfect. I mean, like you understand Kate Bishop very quickly. I'd say in the first episode alone is like you now you immediately understand Kate Bishop's story. Uh, and like, it's, it's kind of like a checking of the boxes. Like, okay, there's a mystery to her family and, um, there's a mystery to her family and she loves Hawkeye and here's why. Like literally it's like, boom, 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 done. And the rest doesn't even matter. Like for me, it doesn't even matter at this point because it's all at this point, it's all fun and games and all exploring more of the organized crime angle of the MCU, which we don't get to see too much of because in the movies, we don't get a lot of organized crime. We literally get like top Avengers level threat stuff. And I'm like, yes, I'm on board for this. And, and this goes back to what I'm talking about. Like, Disney Plus, I'm actually more excited now because I'm excited to see what's going to happen because of the events of the Avengers, which which to me feels more of a direct result of the Battle of New York or anything the Avengers have done all through the Infinity Saga. Are We're now seeing the fruits of that labor. And that's, that's something I need directly from as a viewer. Um, so yeah, right. And, and, you know, you talk about, you know, we get more than the tracksuit mafia, which are actual Marvel characters, by the way. <laughs> um, but you know, this, this Dukas family or, or I do, I don't even know how to pronounce their last name. Duquesne? They're actually a Marvel, Marvel character. The, oh. the, 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 the fiance, uh, of, uh, Kate Bishop's mom is a Marvel character. He's the swordsman, which was a big Avengers character yeah he's the swordsman Whoa. and which is perfect because the second episode she challenges him to a fencing match because he fancies swords and uh and yeah i was like i was like why is why is his name so familiar i looked it up online and lo and behold he is he is the swordsman wow i've never heard of this guy but i i thought they made him up for the show but that's incredible and you know what to add to the simplicity that you mentioned they're they're taking full advantage of their setting because they have that unique yes. setting. Uh, how many nineties movies did we grow up with Ryan where the, the, the point of the story is character has to get to his family in time for Christmas. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Uh, Cause you know, we're on 26 Marvel movies right now. Yeah. And you know, there's only so many times you can do the plot of, we have to defeat villain X before he does Y, or we have to obtain MacGuffin A in order to do B. And I, I'm not complaining. I like those stories too, but it's always nice to freshen things up a little bit and do something, you know, that you don't expect. And uh, here comes right. Hawkeye with a Christmas setting the first time since Iron Man three, but not the last. Cause we know no way home is going ho ho home for the holidays too. Um, <laughs> Well played. <laughs> but Hawkeye comes along and is like, we don't need to overcomplicate this. We have a guy who all the time that we've seen him in the MCU before has been about just getting to his family and making sure his family's okay. So that's there. It's literally, pardon the pun, gift wrapped for you. Make the plot just him getting home to his family for Christmas. And that's that's all you need. That's all you need. And, but like, also again, what I love about this too is, is again, the consequences is like, you see him, he's got the hearing aid. He's, you know, he has flashbacks and like post-traumatic stress from, you know, the events of Endgame. Like it, what I love about these, what I love about these Marvel characters is they don't get away from these events scotch-free. Although it may seem like, and that's why Cap is like, Cap is such a higher tier because Cap, you always look at him as this guy who walks away from these events like, oh, yeah, you know, it happened, but we'll just tough on through because that's that's where we, we are humanity. But the truth is, is like they don't walk away from this like as if it, they can just brush it off their shoulders. It's not mm -hmm. the same. It's it's very much different. And I love that. I love already the angle that they're doing with this is that in in Hawkeye in Hawkeye here. You know, he wants to be with his family. 
he wants to have this normal life, but he so far he can't. Like he just can't do it. And it's perfect. It's it's, it's the setting. In my mind, as a comic book fan, it's the perfect setting for a classic comic book story with like, we're going to see really, I think we're going to see some really cool crossovers in this story. Um, but at the same time is we are getting this very human story. And to me, like, that's why I kind of hearken back to that moment with Kate Bishop where she sees Hawkeye and she realizes like, I need to protect my mother. Like I need to be the best of the best. And to me, it's perfect because it's like, it's, you know, we look at these heroes and when you have that kind of relation, you kind of just fall in sync with, it doesn't even matter to the story at this point, because you're already in sync with the, the reality that they've set for this villain, this, this story. And, uh, and so for me now, like, give me the villain, give me every, like, get, the more you give me, at this point, the more Marvel it is. It does like I really hope we get Kingpin out of this. I hundred percent do, hundred percent. I I want it to happen. I want it to happen for you, but more importantly, I want it to happen for just Marvel fans. Like the, the second we see D'Onofrio, I mean, we're gonna be you know happy campers. But my point is, is like you've already established the the character so well that it's like okay i get it i get where they're coming from i get the emotional weight that there's in this story and i'm like i'm i'm already on it for the ride when she goes into that winery uh and the auction is happening and she's peeking through the shelf were you in the same boat as me where you were really hoping she'd look at the crowd and we would see the back of a big bald head with like a white, you know what I, you know, I knew you were going that, that direction already. And, and normally, you know, I would say yes, just because of the hype factor, but yes, I, I actually legitimately was like, Oh man, I just want to see the bald head. Just give me a bit, like, give me those, the, the, the shoulders and the bald head and him just sitting there just be like all kingpin like oh man i was i was all for it i was all for it now do i think it's going to happen i think there's a 50/50 chance that we're either going to see him but it's going to be a doctor claw kind of reference where if we're going to see like just 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 his outline or or his voice or something uh but just as likely i don't think we're going to see him I don't think we will, it but could... that doesn't mean they're not going to allude to him and like mm. tease the crap out of him being there because, because that's, that's something Marvel's been doing really well is like, you can think you can go that way all you want. We're not saying it isn't, but we're not saying it is. It's, it's the classic, like, I'm not saying it's aliens, but, but it's Wilson Fisk. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it, you're yeah. right. It, it's still 50, 50. You're absolutely right. And I, I mean, with the, with hindsight clearing things up had they introduced him that way i think he deserves a bigger better introduction like there's better ways you could introduce him than just like oh there's he's not gonna be till the end exactly yeah Yeah. um so i'm glad they didn't do that but i mean for the for the entirety of this show i am going to be like that i'm going to be like a kid waiting and like hearing a noise like is that santa like every little noise i hear i'm gonna look at my chimney and wonder if somebody's going to come sliding down bearing a sack of murder. Uh, I'm just, I'm ready. I'm ready for him. Uh, and speaking of villains, now you would know, obviously, more than I would know. So tell me if I'm on the right track here, Ryan. But yeah. I don't trust Kate's mom one bit. I don't. She's up to something. And so you shouldn't, sir. Oh, yeah. so you shouldn't. Yeah, there's something She's fishy. tied up with some pretty sketchy people. Yeah, the um I, I I feel like the stepdad is obviously not, you know, he's he's not a good person. He's kind of a slime ball, but I think he's there to make the audience put the audience in Kate's shoes and make the audience mistrust him because she mistrusts him. But meanwhile, there's mom doing all the really bad stuff. Um, I could kind of hear what she was saying when she's arguing with the older guy. And he said like, don't you mess with me. I have powerful friends. And then, well, he turns up dead 
Uh, I don't care how many sword and fencing lessons Jack has. Those swords are in Kate's mom's apartment. She's got access to them. So as far as I'm concerned, until I'm proven otherwise, Vera Farmiga was the one who walked into that nice, beautiful apartment with the monogram butterscotch and committed the murder in question. I mean, yeah, so so we have the swordsman now, and the swordsman is is a big comic book character from like the late seventies, early eighties. Um, and I mean, he is exactly as he sounds. He's kind of an anti-hero kind of character. Does he have a mustache his... in the comics too? Yes, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, he does. Um, for those of you listening to the podcast, he did the gesture of like he has like the kind of Captain Hook mustache. Um, but uh, he. Yeah, he's kind of an anti-hero kind of character where he's been the villain, but he's also been a hero at some point, and then he's kind of danced between the two two a bit. But um, but he is legit, like, the best swordsman in all of Marvel kind of thing. Um, but it, it kind of seems like the show is alluding to, uh, obviously, organized crime, which would allude to Kingpin, but I don't... Again, I don't think we'll ever get to his level. If in the end, I think I think the kingpin will be an end credit at best, or they'll just keep alluding to the idea that the kingpin is there. Oh. I don't know. I I'd be amazed if he's. I would be delightfully surprised if he's a, a main story driving character. I doubt it. Uh, my money, my money is actually on uh, Yelena making her appearance and and being a pretty key story character. Um, and Echo, I, I already, you know, with Echo, I mean, we're kind of jumping all over the place already. But Echo, I think, is not only because she's getting her own show, but rightfully so. Right out of like the first two scenes we see her in, I'm I'm already excited for this character. I'm I'm like, give me more of her already. And and we all know based on what I told you from the last podcast, um, Echo is when we talked about the Marvel announcements, Echo is a really interesting character. She has a really cool backstory. Um, she's a deaf a deaf character, but she's the adopted daughter of Kingpin. And we kind of got that story a little bit already with Gamora and Thanos being the adopted daughter of Thanos kind of thing. Right. But, but at the same time, I don't see why they wouldn't kind of play up that formula a longer, like the family formula seems to be constant throughout Marvel at this point. Um, if you look at Eternals, you look at Song Chi, you look at, um widow black widow even all these stories are all family centric stories all of them 100 mm -hmm. um loki even if you want to if you want to debate loki loki's yeah. a, a family story because family is a relatable uh, thing it's more relatable than a blue android lady who can be split up in 17 pieces so yeah that's the best way to get us connected to all these people 100 percent and uh so i hate saying that but like it's true so <laughs> so hawkeye i think because of the story of family is a very prevalent thing um i mean hawkeye wants to be the father that's there for his kids and he can't be because of all the stuff that's going on uh but he's obviously going to be a father-like figure to kate bishop I don't see why Kingpin would be the opposite where he is this close father figure, but he's not the best father figure. You know, he's not exactly, he's, he's, you know, he's a means to an end kind of thing. Exactly. If this season, uh, if echo is our main villain for this show and which, which she is, let's face it. Yeah. It is. looks like she is. Uh, and if it ends with her kind of being defeated and down and out, um, you know, maybe what she did was good enough to attract his attention. And he's like, listen, you're good. You could be better. Let me teach you a few things. Have an omelet. Yeah. Right. And have an, have an omelet. Yeah. That's and then that's the show. That's the Echo show. And I am totally okay with that because the smaller his part is in Hawkeye, the more we know we're seeing him everywhere else. Right. So yes. She Hulk. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, I'm still of the mind of the hope that uh, he's the one who was talking to Sharon Carter on the phone. Um, but speaking of characters that you don't see, this dog shows up. 
He's blind in one eye. He's a very cute dog. And the first time we see him, Kate's like, hey, what's up, dog? You're cool. And he's like checking her out. And they have a moment. And then somebody whistles and the dog goes away. And the next time we see the dog again, he's on his own. What's the deal with this dog? Who's whistling at him? Is there something we don't know? Um, I don't, honestly, I'm not a hundred percent sure about the dog, about the whistle and the dog in the, in terms of that correlation. I know the dog is a very prevalent character throughout the Hawkeye story. His name is Lucky, Lucky the dog. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and he has the one eye and, and eventually gets an eye. I think he gets an eye patch or something like that. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, honestly, I don't know if the whistle means anything at this point or who, who made the whistle or that sort of thing. Um, I think what's interesting about the story is Hawkeye's legacy. It seems to be the big topic of interest of this of the beginning of the story. I mean, if we're going to talk about it, what I think is pretty cool is I, first of all, I love the Steve Rogers play. Oh my God. Um, I could do, and I love the song is I could do this all day. Do I, this all is, day. I love it. I think it's so, so cheesy. Yeah. I love it so much. I love that um, Ant-Man was there. They're talking about the battle of New York and like Ant-Man's just like, Hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that, uh, I think what's interesting here is we're getting more I, as Marvel fans, we're getting more of the Ronin story um which is like again his like damaged i think his damaged psyche in the sense of like he lost his family and just went on like a wild rampage which i thought was pretty cool i i honestly think i don't think you need to pay attention too much to the whistle for lucky i don't i don't i i I just personally don't know enough about this story to to in order to say like it could be this or it could be that yeah it could have literally just been somebody around the corner hailing a cab and that got his attention like it could be yeah. nothing at all. Uh, I just thought it was interesting that this stray, I was like, is somebody calling the stray dog? But uh, you're right. It could have just been some sneaky Feige stuff going on. The uh, Feige radar, man. He's yeah. going to, he's going to, he's honestly, he's going to distract you. He's going to try to distract you and make you think one thing until it's something else. It was right? Mephisto whistling. Oh my god, I don't think we're ever gonna get Mephisto. <laughs> at this it was point, either I don't him, think we're ever gonna get it. was him or Annihilus. Christine Everhart was whistling <laughs> at um at no. the dog. By the way, yesterday uh I watched Spider-Man 2, and it's been many, many years since I watched Spider-Man 2. Great movie. Great it's beautiful. I had a big smile on my face the whole time. And the subway car scene where he stops the subway train, there's an extra on the subway and i'm like 90 percent sure it's leslie bibb no she's way. the lady with the baby i i don't know if she talks but i i looked up leslie bibb's imdb and i didn't see spider-man 2 on it but i don't think they put it if she was just a background but i'm pretty sure it's her it looks a lot like her could be so i mean annihilus is floating through the multiverse i'm just saying <laughs> Um, well, what's interesting though, is the news guy, we have the news guy who's playing through the whole thing. Um, the same news guy we saw in Spider-Man is the same news guy we saw in Hawkeye. Oh, okay. When, uh, like when Hawkeye's kids are watching the news, that guy was in like far from home and stuff. Yeah. It was the same guy. Uh, oh, wow. I guess he's a New York uh, newscaster. That's, that's attention to detail, man. That's great. Good for them. That's what I watch it for, man. Yeah. Is, uh, but I mean, like, but that's what I'm talking about. Like, again, I think what I like about New York is like the more stuff that happens in New York, the more likely you're going to see more crossover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it creates a little breeding ground. And I mean, I know this is absolutely not a street level story, but because it's New York and because it's Christmas, do you think there will be any crossover with No Way Home at all? Any, even just like Jameson showing up for like a second. Like, is this possible? Um, I think it's possible. I definitely think it's possible at this point. I, I, I mean, the timing of the show is pretty sus. sus. It's pretty sus mm-hmm. in my in, in my opinion because, uh, because okay, what the first two episodes came out now, and we're gonna assume what ten episodes, give or take. 
six. It's going to end on the 22nd. So by the time it ends, Spider-Man will have come out. Yeah, that's that's pretty sus, dude. That's pretty sus. Yeah. So, I mean, here's the thing, though, is that what do we know thus far about the show? Because we know the rumors are so heavy that that Yelena is going to make an appearance. Mm -hmm. And I I think she's even credited to make like in IMDb to make an appearance. Yeah, I think so. So we know that's going to happen for sure. Um, Here's the thing, though, is that Disney Plus is more on the track of the multiverse than anything else. So because like you look at falcon winter soldier you know we have a new captain america and then what we also kind of got a glimpse of like you know there's they're kind of making the dark avengers kind of thing um like basically what i'm trying to say is with the disney plus shows there seems like they're building more quickly to wherever the story is the wherever the saga is going kind of thing Uh, whereas the movies kind of are way more mysterious. Like Eternals was such a wild shot in the dark for what they're trying to do. Uh, as opposed to like even Song chi like the end credits, I don't even know what they're trying to refer to. I have, I have my guesses, but I have no idea. And then you have shows like Loki, WandaVision, all this stuff here, which is basically definitely alluding to a multiverse in some way, shape or form. Um, but at the same time too, is that we, there, it's more obvious how they're going to connect, right? It kind of seems like the new Avengers are assembling through Disney plus yeah. plus on top of that, Kang the Conqueror. Plus on top of that, whatever, um, Contessa Valentino's up to. Exactly. But that's, that's my point, right? Yeah. Like the dark, the dark Avengers or whatever. Right. So, I mean, that's that's just it so for me disney plus series are a little more consistent i guess is the best word kind of consistent towards wherever they're going which seems more multiverse ish Mm -hmm. um obviously doctor strange when that trailer comes out we'll have a way better idea on like what we can expect but hawkeye again that's what i love about hawkeye it's a really simple story it's a simple story about the impact of the Avengers and on top of that, like what we can expect from uh, what we can expect from Kate Bishop as a character and what she's going to do. Uh, But it's a fun character. I mean, she's, you know, she, I I think what I love about this origin story for her is like, she knows she has to be better in order to protect her, her her and her her mom. Um, And on top of that is like, like she just she doesn't know how in over her head she is and i think that's what's gonna be interesting about this whole show with hawkeye is like she's gonna she's like she thinks she's like yeah no one saw who i am no one's gonna know i'm ronin blah 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 and then literally like the tracksuit mafia knows where to get her and then on top of that now clint is like totally wrapped up in it and he, he thinks he can gets all wrapped up and tucked away before Christmas. That's which is obviously not going to happen. <laughs> um, but I mean, most of these stories take place, you know, within two days, but like they're the most epic two days ever. But to be fair, I like we, this, this whole thing, like Christmas is six days. There's something tells me is like the next five days are going to be nuts for, for Clint. So. I think so. Um, and I, I love what they have set up so far to introduce us and get us on board with Kate. Um, yeah. You mentioned like how, how charismatic she is and how she's in over her head, but we, we've come to like her as this one person already. We've only known her for like an hour and 10 minutes. Um, I, she reminds me of Axel Foley from the Beverly Hills cop movies. Like she's so okay. good at talking herself out of trouble like she is yeah. she's the queen of bs like she can when when greg comes by and he's like i'm greg uh what are you what are you talking about i didn't tell you to work here what's your name and just her response of like see greg you don't even know my name i quit like that is so cool that's how you talk your way out of a situation this girl has the potential to survive just on wits alone 
even if she wasn't a good archer, even if she couldn't fence and kick butt and do daredevil flips on flagpoles, I think she could still, just by the merit of like her quick tongue, she could get herself out of a lot of scrapes. And I, I think that yeah. that is a, a type of Marvel hero we haven't really seen yet. And it's nice to see somebody like that. Like uh, Steve Rogers, God bless him. I love him. I don't think he could talk his way out of a paper bag. <laughs> so it's nice to have no. somebody like this. But but what also I like about this uh, as well with the Avengers and, and everything that's going on is like, yes, we're going to see a ton of vigilantes. Mm-hmm. Like even Hawkeye calls it out like right out of the gate. When we go to Kate Bishop's apartment, he she's explaining like how she does what she does. And he's like, another vigilante. Like he's just, he gets it right out of the gate. And and yes, like that's that's going to happen. The whole reason like Wolverine exists and, you know, um, uh, you know, Iron Man exists and all these other characters is because like they made Captain America. And then after that, they tried to recreate Captain America in some way, shape or form. And and so that's what I think I love the most about this whole battle in New York setting up Kate Bishop character is because it's like, yes, the Avengers event happened. So clearly we're going to see a lot more you know, uh, we're going to see a lot more attempts at new heroes. So, you know, like, that's why I love like Kate Bishop seeing Hawkeye do his thing. Now she's going to be the next Hawkeye, you know, She-Hulk, we're going to get She-Hulk and She-Hulk's, you know, the Hulk exists because they were trying to recreate Captain America in, in their own way, shape or form. So, you know, all this stuff is, is, is like, yes, there's so much consequence and it's, and, and to me, I can't stress enough of, of like, why aren't we seeing more of that? Like we're seeing all these new stories, but they're still very disconnected because like Black Widow is like more, it's too direct to Black Widow, like her her as a character as opposed to the legacy she left behind. Mm-hmm. Whereas like if we do see Yelena in this show, which is going to be awesome because we're going to see the legacy, like we're going to see consequences of Endgame influencing the story. And yes, because I think the MCU at this point is so much more established. So at this point, you can play with the lore to make it more accessible and build off of the build off of these new stories. And so that's why I'm like, I'm curious to see where this is going to go, because because now, again, I'm already hooked. I'm already like, OK, yes, I've watched Endgame. I've seen Hawkeye do his thing. And I get why she exists in this world, but now she's exposed to this. Now she's exposing this uh, organized crime syndicate kind of thing, and and that this the, the swordsman's involved. So okay, like what more is there? Like why was this Armand guy uh, threatening her mom? Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, yeah. Like what is everybody up to? I I feel like there's a lot of, and I like when this happens, there are a lot of different pieces in play and they all want different things. You know, what Armand wanted is not what Jack wants and it's not what mom wants. I forget the mom's name. And it's clearly not what Kate wants. Um, and then at some point it's going to intersect, which is beautiful. Um, let me drop this question on you, Ryan. Yeah. Did Kate's mom murder kate's dad uh i don't think she did you don't think she did no that was an awfully quiet death for a giant apocalyptic fight and she rushed over to her daughter awfully (laughs) that was an awfully big house it was a very you're right that was a ginormous house she could have just been in the east wing but uh yeah the um i mean rich people am i right (laughs) yeah Something about the fact that she called for her parents in the the stairway. She called for them many times. And then all this destruction was happening. If a mother's, if a, if a parent's first instinct when they hear calamity is not, let me go see if my child's okay. Something's not right. And I mean, just look, I mean, like, look, look, look at what happens with, with Clint. Clint is like 
Get in the car, kids. I haven't seen the youngest one in four seconds. Oh my God, where is he? Oh, he's over there just looking at the building. Like that is apparent. So if if Chitari are breaking the city and your first instinct is not, I'm going to go get my little girl, you are either being murdered or murdering. <laughs> so I I don't trust her. I think that... Uh, you know, she saw she was clearly not not happy with him. Uh, he wanted to sell the house, and she wasn't having that. Um, I don't know what's she going did, on there. She did specifically, and here's the interesting part. And this is why I'm like, oh, it's Kingpin. It's got to be Kingpin because she said the penthouse. She didn't say the penthouse of what, but it, but Kingpin lives in the penthouse of the Rockefeller, doesn't he? Oh, I don't. It's been a hot minute since I saw Daredevil. I don't know. I thought they were just talking about their house because then she says, I don't, um, Kate says, I don't want to move. That's true. Yeah, I thought they were talking about the house. It seemed like it was like his family home and he wanted to sell. I don't know. There's there's obviously more to that story, but I think yeah. she uh, she figured, well, New York is being attacked. If I just break his neck right now, all my problems are solved and I can blame it on the sky monsters. Oh hi, honey! I didn't hear you calling me. Let's go run now. That's yeah. I uh, there's some funny business going on there. I mean, you you bring up a good point, and again, I mean, the sky's the limit at this point. Like, I'm very, I'm very interested to see who's the main villain of this and why. Like, and that's the other thing is like, I love the black market scene because it alludes to again, like, there's there's obviously more going on here. I think one of the key things of the story, the key things that are driving the story is the mom's relationship with Jack, Jack or whatever his name is. Um, And then there's Echo's story with the tracksuit mafia and Ronan. Uh, And then, and, and here's the other thing is that not only that is with Ronan, Ronan killed a lot of organized crime. Like he apparently is the vigilante who, who essentially assassinated many organized crime syndicate members. So that's got to be, that's got to, that's a big question to answer. Mm-hmm. And so, and then on top of that is like Hawkeye, what is Hawkeye I'm trying to do here is he trying to like wrap up everything make sure everything's tied up in a nice neat little bow or uh like or what like what's going on here so there's a lot there's again i think the story has a this story has a lot of potential and and they've already hit a lot of notes of the marvel formula which is a lot of references to comic books great characters some cross we haven't seen crossovers yet but we know crossovers are coming so it's already checked off a lot of the 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 boxes for a good marvel experience so i'm just i think what's curious is is like where is the story going and and what's 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 going to come out of it and and loki i think was the biggest one i mean what if was what if we talked about a lot of like okay it's it's a fun experience and and you know what if is like you know, this whole nod to the idea of like, oh yeah, you know, an alternate universe, there's alternate universes, there's this going on. But with the other shows like Loki, uh, Falcon Winter Soldier, WandaVision, uh, there's a pretty kind of specific goal. Uh, and, and it's kind of building up this kind of, you know, whatever Valentina is up to, but Again, it's building towards something. So I don't know, but we don't know who Valentino works for. We have to assume it's either Norman Osborn or Kingpin. And I love not knowing. It's so nice not knowing after so many years of knowing we were building to Thanos. It's so nice yeah. to have this mystery. Refresh my memory. Did Valentina tell Yelena to recruit Hawkeye or to kill him? Kill him. Kill him. Okay. Here's... Uh, she said, and I quote, here's your next target. He's kind of handsome, isn't he? His name's Clint Barton. Okay. He's he's responsible. And then I think it was like the last line is he's responsible for killing Natasha. Right. Yeah. She played that card because they were at the grave. So, yeah. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure she's not going to kill him. I mean, who knows? Stranger things have happened. I, I honestly think it'd probably be pretty 
pretty good if he if she did. It would be a very interesting twist. Um, but I don't think whether or not she kills him, I don't think the show is going to end with Yelena in a position of villainy. Um, so I think she will, uh, when this, when Hawkeye, the show is said and done, Yelena will have turned her back on Valentina. I think that's what's going to happen. And if she turns her back on Valentina, I think she will tell Kate or whoever this lady's up to something, so we have to keep an eye on her. Okay. I think the last the last kind of big thought I'm going to throw into this is that I think because the whole theme of the first two episodes is like the legacy that Hawkeye's left behind and he doesn't he doesn't want a brand and all this stuff. Yeah. I think uh I think that his death is going to be faked. And and Ooh. the family is going to see on the news that like, oh, Hawkeye's been murdered or what have you. And then he comes home and that's it. Like he's now, he's finally off the radar. He's off the grid and he can now go be with his family for the rest of his life, for the rest of, for the rest of his life. And, uh, but I think that's what it's going to take. He's going to realize this was going to take to get him out of this whole life is that he has to fake his death and Yelena is his way out. I like that. And then, you know, 10 years down the road, we maybe see an old man Hawkeye. Um, and I think, wasn't his family in witness protection at some point yeah. already? Yeah. yeah. So, or like shield witness protection. Yeah. Uh, so if he fakes his death, especially if he has people like Valentina or Fisk going after him, uh, if he fakes his death, he could kind of bring his family into the fold and be like, we're all off the grid, kids. Uh, let's have an off the grid Christmas that, uh, that could very well have been foreshadowed by just how he's sort of prepping the kids and, you know, telling them you're in charge, you know, do, you know, I, uh, I, well, not only that, I think it was also foreshadowed in, in end game when he was ready to sacrifice himself for his family. Right. Yeah. He was willing to jump off of Vormir. So, <sighs> I don't know. This is tricky. More and more, it looks like he might die. You're right. It looks like they might kill Hawkeye. Fake death, though. Fake, fake death. death. Fake death. Uh, or like a like a like a a Batman: The Dark Knight Rises death, where literally not even the other Avengers know. Like only yeah. his family knows. Um, and then you know, somewhere down the line, Michael Caine spots him at a cafe in Paris. And he's like, I looked across the banks at the same. There he was. There was Hawkeye. <laughs> I was having a big exactly. party. Yeah. Um, that's that's a really cool ending, man. So I, I like this. I like where this is going. And I'm just on board for this show. I'm so excited for the rest of this show. Um, and I'm glad. I think it's because they, they proved me wrong. They proved my fear wrong. That they can still do street level while still being colorful and not resorting to the cliches. So that has yeah. kept my excitement going. Uh, my last question for you is, if you were to go see a live show right now, would you rather see one where the band is called Tracksuit Mafia or the band is called Monogrammed Butterscotch? Monogrammed Butterscotch sounds mm. really entertaining. I yeah. mean, Tracksuit Mafia is fun, but Monogrammed Butterscotch? Bro, I like that idea, bro. <laughs> but you're right. I think the idea of the Tracksuit Mafia, like the Russian mob, villain is kind of overplayed a little bit but another reason why i think evidence is pointing towards kingpin is in even in daredevil the kingpin's first kind of mafia he dealt with was the russians that's right yeah and then he worked his way to um oh what's her name the old woman what was her gang called were they just oh the, madam gao madam, madam gao, gao were they the, just yakuza the or were they serpent. Steel, so yes, yeah. So he worked his way to some like cooler gangs like that, like a gang with a name, a gang that's got some color, some flavor to it. Uh, so yeah, this doesn't rule him out at all. He's waiting in the wings. But what I'm really looking forward to now is getting to know Echo because just from that one little taste of her that we got, I'm already on board. Yeah, touching the speakers. She's scary. I'm already afraid of this lady. So mm -hmm. this is on a great track. I hope she's the villain. I still don't trust Mrs. Bishop. 
And I still think she is a villain, but I hope Echo is the main villain because already she seems like she's a more interesting antagonist. Yeah, I think I, I, I think Kevin Feige, I, there's obviously a reason why Kevin Feige immediately gave her a show. And I don't blame, I don't, I do not blame him in any way, shape or form. I'm, I already see it. Like I just based on the scenes she's in, I think, I think we're in for a good ride. Um, you know, Christopher Nolan once said, you know, I think that dialogue doesn't tell us uh, or something along the lines of like dialogue does not tell as much as story as visuals. I th- or I think he said something along the lines of visuals can tell a stronger story than dialogue. And Echo had two scenes at most. And it already seemed like, like it's telling a bigger story than we know. Oh, not even two shots. Like... <laughs> She was, they, they, it was literally right before the the credits came on. So yeah, they've taken this person and set her up in a really grand way. And just the way she touches the speakers, I'm already looking forward to a villain like we've never seen before with her. Yeah. Uh, What a show. Two episodes in already. What a show. I'm just... I'm I'm all into this. This is exciting. Oh boy, Ryan, where can the people find you when you're not in New York celebrating Christmas? Uh, as always, you can always find me on twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada. If you want to find me on social, it's Ryan J. Whitehead, uh, at Ryan J. Whitehead for Instagram, and it's at Crusader Online for Twitter. And you can find me on Twitter also, sometimes at Andrew Fantasia at Instagram at Andrew underscore Fantasia. I always forget the underscore and I don't know if that matters. I don't know how to social media. Um, And then uh, you can find me here on the YouTubes in the the, the Rebel Scum Podcast Network channel or on my channel, Andrew Fantasia. Uh, I'm here, I'm there, I'm everywhere. I bounce around a lot, just like Kate Bishop. I I can't do the flagpole thing though, yet. (laughs) I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Just don't judge me. I also can't ring a bell with an arrow or fight my mustache stepdad with a sword. Um, but we'll see uh, as the James Bond fan in me um, would, would attest. I think the only thing missing from that fencing scene was Madonna, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> maybe next week, maybe they're saving that for episode three. Uh, for sure. Any final words on Hawkeye, my friend? Uh, I think I think Disney Plus is definitely definitely where it's at for good Marvel content, uh, and I'm I'm leaning I'm I'm gonna say more on the the real side than the uh, the cartoon side. As much as I liked What If, I I think that the real life shows are really onto something, and it's gonna be awesome. So I think I think the last thing I want to say about Hawkeye is is that I think Marvel Marvel knows their formula, and Hawkeye is definitely adapting that formula really well. And we're in for a really good ride. And and if you haven't watched it yet and you're kind of hesitant, you need to watch it. Well said, sir. Until next week, until episode three, I hope all of you have a marvelous day. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.